Do you think that being deaf, do you think that somehow sort of influences your art? Deaf people communicate visually and that does show in my artwork. I feel both deaf and hearing people can still make sense of my work. This is a painting I did in Melbourne. It's an Australian advertisement that I've added my own text to make people think about being deaf. And can you tell me, do you see yourself as like, do you identify yourself as a deaf artist? My art has a lot of different elements. Some of my art includes my deaf identity, some of it doesn't. There are many aspects to my work. Putting on an exhibition is a huge task even harder when there's a communication barrier. Abby's curating Auckland's first exhibition of deaf artists. So why a separate exhibition just for deaf artists? Couldn't those artists just be in any exhibition? There are lots of exhibitions that include work by hearing artists throughout the world. So why not have an exhibition for deaf artists? Being deaf is no barrier to becoming an artist. And deaf people are naturally a visual culture. That's why we're having the exhibition. And we want to present the art to a broader audience so hearing people through this art can see things from a deaf perspective. Hence the exhibition, and we're just going to go for it. In the past, the art of psychiatric patients was seen as a portal to their minds and exhibitions attracted a kind of morbid fascination. But instead of assuming that Andrew Blythe's work represents the thoughts of someone with paranoid schizophrenia, perhaps we should be asking what role does creativity play in keeping people mentally well? Like the therapeutic thing, I act, it's sort of like, you know, you, uh, when I'm painting away I can ignore all other things, including things in my own self, and, you know, I could paint away uh, a thing that I want to do instead of worrying, which I, like, I do a lot, but, <laughs> yeah. Andrew Blythe is a painter in residence at Toyora, a studio space for artists with mental illness. Like before I went to Toyota, like I felt I wasn't really alive even. Andrew experiences delusions. He sometimes feels skeptical and afraid. When we first met him two years ago, he struggled to speak with us. He wasn't really comfortable around anyone. Because I went through a couple of years where I didn't say anything at all to anybody. You know, I somehow thought that it was unnecessary to talk to people and stuff. Now, Andrew has a clear sense of purpose. He's an artist. I told you I wasn't there. I don't know what I would be doing. Um, some patients go gardening and I always felt that it was so useless. <laughs> Does creativity have a kind of therapeutic value for you? Um, well, yes it does, yes it's... Um, I, I was never one to fall in love, you know, with people around the place because I've always been on a dole. But, um, Painting is, it's like being in love, it, or it is being in love. It's like being in love, it's just wonderful, yeah. Art is love. Could there be any higher value? 
Andrew started drawing on scraps of paper. He's had no formal training and feels that's given his work freedom. The art of people in the hospital sort of just come out of the mind like that. We're only trained too and, you know, yet and yet there have been such fine, a lot of fine work, you know, produced at Toyora. Great work, even. It all sort of goes unrecognised, you know, we ought to be you know, having exhibitions with all of our paintings all over the walls, <laughs> everywhere. When I first saw Andrew's work, I, I, I assumed it was work by a graduate student, a painter. He has a gift for the process of applying paint and it's, I think it's highly considered abstract painting. Yeah, they're completely abstract and they non-figurative, you know, they're not pictures of anything else, you know, they're not still lives. I just love looking at his work because I, when I'm looking at his work, I'm looking at his, a record of his choices. And that's what I look at when I look at painting. It's not just pretty pictures. It's a, a little, there's a little story there. You can look at details and see the choices that the artist made. They might be conscious or not conscious. I think in Andrew's work, there's a lot of consciousness and um, he's a very, very serious painter. His work's been shown in Paris and New York. I delight in what he produces. The people I've shown his work to in New York got this, had the same uh, reaction and they immediately compared his work to some of the painters from the 50s who worked in a similar way. So they locate the work in terms of art history. Like, what's in my mind, um, like when I paint, it's, um, you know, I'm always trying to get the whole thing to be perfect. Yeah, concentration and, and um, sort of looking at each tiny letter and um, composing the picture properly and some of the acts of daring, risk taking, you know, and things like that, yeah. A lot of it's thought and composition and you know, hard work and long hours and, if I could, you know, I'd, I'd be working until 12 o'clock, you know, at night. It's a sort of, like, a, it's a, a sort of like a love, really. Who would have thought art had this much power? It crosses language barriers, allows us to convey our emotions. It changes perceptions and opens the mind. It's a way of earning money and respect. Well, I'm inspired. A big thank you to all the artists involved in today's programme.